Joining me now for this week's Touch Bass in Seoul is another world famous classical musician, violinist Cho Jin Ju. She made her concert debut at age seven and then went on to win a whole host of international violin competitions during her young career. After winning another major award in 2014, she declared she would retire from the competition. And since then, in addition to performing, she has devoted her time to teaching younger musicians. She is currently assistant professor at McGill University's Schulich School of Music, and she even founded her own institute to nurture up up-and-coming talent. Uh, most recently, she also released her third album as well. To delve into all of this, Miss Chaw has joined us now in the studio. Hello, it's a pleasure to meet you today. Hi, great to meet you. Yes, let's start at the beginning. And this sure. is something we do ask all musicians who've come through our studios for the first time. But can you share with us how you began playing the violin? Sure. Um, well, I actually began because of my mother's... Um, completely alternative motives like she wanted me to be a scientist this was like her dream life dream to you know have birth a, a scientist okay, in okay. the household and she thought you know she had heard somewhere that Einstein would meditate you know playing the violin and playing the violin and uh, hearing string quartet and playing string quartet was a huge part of his life so she thought okay like I'm gonna make my child smart <laughs> let's make her play the violin turns out I'm much better at violin than science <laughs> <laughs> so that's how it all began so it didn't start as a you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna give this right, child okay. a violin and then see her thrive. It was completely by chance, actually. Yeah. So it was a happy accident. I guess so. Yeah. And then you picked it up very quickly. You improved very quickly, didn't you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was it was um, it was one of those things that became very clear very fast. Um, mm. I did not have that kind of talent or excellence mm. in science class that I, <laughs> the little kitty science class mm. as you enrolled me at, but with violin, it was um, just so much quicker than other kids that uh, it was obvious and it was almost like the violin chose me rather than me choosing the violin, yeah. At that time, you were in South Korea, but then uh, when you were, I understand, 14 years old, you mm -hmm. went to the US and yeah. you kept on playing and you kept on picking picking up awards, right? Yeah, yeah. well, when you say it like that, it sounds very fancy. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I went to the, the Cleveland Institute of Music in mm. Ohio um, because I discovered a, a teacher that I instantly fell in love with mm. in Aspen Music Festival. And um, his name was Paul Cantor, and I had the extreme honor of studying with with him for many years um but yeah yeah it, it it's you know part of the learning to do competitions and hopefully win so um i've also lost a lot so <laughs> <laughs> it makes up for all the wins yeah but as you said you did pick up quite a few wins as well but then uh, as i mentioned in the introduction in 2014 after winning the international violin competition of indianapolis mm -hmm. you parted ways with the competition life right uh, how did you come to that decision and what was that like well, you know, that that year was supposed to be sort of my last year of competition. It was a big year for a competition because mm. um, all the all three sort of the staple competitions for a violin were happening that year or that season for the matter of that uh, matter of fact. Um, it was Tchaikovsky, Queen Elizabeth and Indianapolis were happening all at the same same season. Um, so I, I wanted to do all three and then you know, if if none of them worked out quite as well as I wanted, then I was actually just going to get a doctor's degree and, mm. and pursue like a different um, path of my career. Um, and then the first one turned out so well. And I said, OK, this is it. <laughs> I am done. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I was eager to start more of a performance professional life. Sure. So I, I wanted to kind of shed that competition, studenty life uh, behind and, and start something new. Okay, and after that, you it seemed you uh, found a passion for teaching mm, as well. Yeah. How did that come about? Well, um, you know, I taught from an early age. Um, one of the things that distinguishes Korean musicians, I think, is the fact that you start teaching very young because mm. of necessity. You have a lot of young students every year who are auditioning very intensely for mm. schools, other competition things. Um, so you end up getting a lot of inquiries, actually, just naturally. So I did teach from when I was, you know, I don't know, 19, 20, because it's nice cash also when you're <laughs> working and it's much better than working, you know, uh, mm. minimum wage jobs. Mm. So you're going to just do it. <laughs> um, so I, I had taught from an early age, but um, when it became really clear to me was, 
you know, between competitions, I, I took a year off or, or actually two, two, three years off of competition mm. because I was just very tired of it. And I, I took up many jobs mm. during that time. Um, I taught, I played in a regional orchestra, I played, you know, I, I did basically everything you could do with the violin. Mm. And then um, I was getting paid the least with teaching, but I actually enjoyed it the most. Mm. Then it became really clear to me, okay, so this is what I like to do. And and it was, it, yeah, it wasn't something, again, that I chose. I think choice is not like a thing that's been given to my life somehow. <laughs> it's <laughs> It feels more like I, I try a bunch of things and then I realize what I like the best. Um, so teaching mm. came about the same way. And then from that point on, I always thought, okay, like, you know, I'm not someone who can just perform and, and not have a security in, in a financial and also, um, sort of, um, I don't know, like a group mm, dynamic sure. way. So, so I, I thought I would always teach and perform at the same time. What was it about teaching that you found fulfilling that seemed to fit for you? Is it the fact that you're seeing the students grow and progress or what is it about that the aspect of teaching? I think it's you? it's just you know I just think that it's fascinating to see another human being grow and transform themselves um in any way, you know, and and to see that happen this is a very egotistical way of describing it because you know to see that happen because of me and right, because of the tiny piece of information that mm. I've given to that person, seeing that pivot, the moments of pivot for that person is fascinating mm. and, um, to be frank, kind of addictive. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the fact that you can seem to change them, though, uh, perhaps shows that you are a good teacher as well. Mm, I hope so, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You're currently an assistant professor at uh, McGill University's Shulin School of Music, mm -hmm. a post that you started in 2018. But you're also the founder and artistic director of Encore Chamber Music, yes. which offers, I understand, intensive summer training program for yes. young performance. Yes. Can you tell us a bit more about that? It sounds fascinating. Sure, yeah. Um, you know, when I won, I actually won two major competitions in my life, and one of them happened sort of by happy coincidence um, or, or by chance when I was 17. So when I won in 2006, I, I, I wasn't really able to make something out of that. It seemed like, okay, I won, so what? Like, I... I played a bunch of concerts, and that was about it. And so um, from that experience, I always thought, okay, if I ever have another major win, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make something out of that. I'm going to mm. create something out of that hype because that hype does not last forever. It's actually mm. very short. Mm. Um, so you, I'm going to somehow utilize that hype and make something great um, that, that has a positive impact on my life and as well as others. Mm. Um, so it seems natural to form sort of a, a festival because mm. that's where I learn the most intensely um, as a music student. Um, you think that, you know, going to great schools and studying with the right teachers is enough, but usually with um, very driven professional young musicians, uh, summer training is absolutely essential because mm. that's when you really can dive into the craft of playing the violin and, and learning the music without worrying about classes and homeworks and every other sort of human being things that you have to worry about. Um, so summer becomes this very immersive uh, time um, where you only think about music. And there's also so, sort of this dreamy days about summer, you mm. know, it's, which provides this uh, magical air. So I wanted to create a summer festival and um, that's what I did. When I won, <laughs> and that the... was in 2015, right? You yeah. were just uh, 27 years old then, around that that time. Yeah, yeah, I was quite young and mm. and and fearless, um, mm. completely fearless. I don't know how I did it, honestly. <laughs> Looking back, it seems it seems surreal mm. to to think back. I think it was only possible because I didn't know how hard it would be, mm. and that has continued to grow and uh, get more members each year. Yes. Uh, let's talk more recently now. Uh, you've become involved in making content for YouTube as well, right? <laughs> yeah. I've seen some of the videos. It's, it's about uh, your teaching and answering questions that anyone has about you know the life of uh, of what it means to be a violinist. Right. Uh, what made you want to start that sort of content? 
I guess boredom, like, <laughs> you know, during COVID times, like, what am I going to do if I'm not going to do something fun? Um, mm. It's, you know, it's it, that that whole video series doesn't require a lot of setup. It's just my kitchen table and, mm. um, you know, a, a very, mm. uh, very, very modest lighting and, and a small camera. So, um yeah, it it became something fun that I wanted to do and to utilize the time that I had. Yeah. And what's it been like for a classical musician during this era of a pandemic where mm. uh, performances might be limited and uh, there's all these uh, issues about going from overseas? You're based in the US and Canada, mm-hmm. uh, but you're coming here to Korea to perform. How is all that, juggling all that? Well, traveling is quite difficult um, and, and it's certainly... It certainly isn't the same, mm. and I, I trust that it's never going to be the same. Mm. Um, I'm sure a lot of things will be replaced, and a lot of changes will happen even from this point on, even beyond back vaccine years. Mm. Um, but, you know, honestly, I, I, I've also found some joy in 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 solidarity that I was able to have and had have come to realize that that moment alone and sort of that intimacy that you have with yourself is absolutely mm. essential in an artist. Mm. Um, and I think that was, that was a quality that I had forgotten about for mm. many years just because I've, I've been so busy since the win in 2014. I, I've been just kind of going, going, going completely nonstop for the past six years. Um, so it, it it actually gave me a lot of creative space in my brain to mm. do something and, and to... Um, make something of my own. So, and and I've, what I've also found interesting and uh, surprising, was that I didn't miss performing so much. Actually, mm, like I love mm. performing, but I didn't miss it as much, or at least I seem not to miss it as much as my my colleagues or other performers. And I was thinking about why, um, because it seems so weird. It's my life. I've been, mm. I've been doing it since, like you said, age of seven. Um, why didn't I miss it so much? And I realized it's because it's music that I fell in love with, not necessarily like the component of receiving attention and, mm. um, you know, kind of presentation part of the music is just something that I have to do and mm. something that I, I must do um, to share the music. But it's not the component of of my career that I fell in love with. I really love making music and that part never went away. In fact, that relationship of me and my music actually deepened during mm. the pandemic times. Um, and that must have given you room to make your new album that we, of exactly. course, have to talk about, yeah. uh, La Capricious. Is, am I getting that right? La Capricious, I think, okay, yeah. Okay, yes. And yeah. Uh, it came out last week, November 6th. Can you introduce our listeners to it? Sure. Um, uh, I guess you could call it the COVID recording. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it was really recorded at the heart of COVID, uh, the peak mm. of COVID um, in June. And um, it, 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 it has a lot of the very attractive um, encore pieces that shows the spectrum of the instrument violin um, in a very uh, large and varied ways. Mm. Um, I chose repertoire on purpose that shows that kind of uh, variety of Mm. the colors that that violin can create. Um, And I'm, I'm very proud of it. I, you know, took care of every single component of this recording. So it feels like I finally put something that I could call my own creative product. Yeah. Unfortunately, we are out of time. The time has flown by, so we have to wrap it up there. We've been speaking to violinist Cho jin Ju, whose new album, La Capricious, yes. is out now. Ms. Jo, it was great to have you with us. Thank you for coming in. Thank you so much for having me.